Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Ann Martin, president of the Ashton Museum. I've been told that since I have the elementary teacher's playground voice, <laughs> that I don't need the microphone. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Very, oh, see, I do have that voice. Um, we're so pleased to have us join us as we begin, as Betsy said, our fall series of history talks. As you heard, the museum has lots going on. We have lots of programming that we do throughout the year, and it's the support of our members and friends who, that make all that we do possible. So come out and take one of our special tours at the cemetery or participate in um, one of our uh, guided tours that we have in the neighborhoods as we give the history there as well. And our program tonight is in conjunction with the 100th anniversary, the centennial celebration of our train station, which was designed by Ashland native Duncan Lee and opened in August of 1923. Now, in, now tonight's program, I am especially delighted to welcome our speaker, who is also a friend, Dick Beatles. And he has his two daughters with him this evening, Dabney and Debbie, welcome as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, when I read the remarks that Dick sent for me to use for his introduction, I knew that I could not change his wording. For within his words, you will discover his wit and humor, his love of our natural environment, as well as his passion for the railroads and transportation. Tonight, we will be treated, you will be treated as you learn and discover the many ups and down the tracks of railroading in Ashland. So Dick, as I begin, I'm gonna start with your words and we get a little history. He, he began in Chesterfield County, but it wasn't long before that was annexed by the city in 1942. He graduated from the old John Marshall downtown in 1955 and then he went on to uh, Richmond Professional Institute, which we now know as VCU, and um, he, got, he received a BS in business in the academic year of 1959-60. While a student at, uh, BC, at RPI, he worked for the railroad. Then after graduation, he was in the military for his first six months of 1960, and then went into the reserves but he was called back to active duty in what he characterized as the so-called Berlin Crisis of 1961-62. He says that to describe himself, he might say that he is a superannuated transportation aficionado. <laughs> well, I, I knew some of those words, but I wasn't quite sure about superannuated. Am I pronouncing it annuated? Superannuated. So I looked it up. That means that he was allowed to retire from service on account of age or infirmity. <laughs> we know he was not infirm, so it was definitely because of age. Translation, according to him, is he's an old guy who still cares a lot about transportation. The retired transportation and real estate executive discovered his passion for multimodal transportation at a very early age. Soon thereafter, he gained first-hand awareness of the fragile state of our natural environment. These and other interests came together years later with his corporate exposure to land development responsibilities and the need to reconcile public and private desires for economic development with transportation and mobility constraints. And the age-old questions of who pays, who benefits, and what is the impact on planet Earth? One thing Dick, Pe Dick Beatles says he is certain, nothing gets built or is left out except for supportive public policy. That is the way it was when the first surveys of the rf &P Railroad were made in 1834, and that's the way it is today with our Virginia multimodal transportation system. Beatles spent his college years working for the former Seaboard Airline Railroad as a locomotive fireman. I'm impressed, that's hard work. And for Chesapeake and Ohio as a train man. He joined RF&P in 1960 as a clerk trainee and was named president in 1985. 
Slightly more than a year later, he was tapped by CSX to serve as CEO of CSX Realty, the developmental arm of CSX Corp. In 1992, Beatles moved over to launch MGT Realty Advisors, a component of the former Morton G. Tolheimer's Realty Group. Thereafter, he was one of several Richmond business and community leaders who, together with partners from around the state, formed Virginians for High Speed Rail. More recently, he served as a fellow of the Virginia Rail Policy Institute. And I must add in here, it's not in his notes, but he has helped us in Ashland, particularly at the museum, having given us advice and information. He's part of FCD, a railroad run through it. Uh, he's given us information on how we are to go about our, uh, a park, a railroad park in Ashland. So, Dick, we appreciate all that you have contributed to Ashland as well. Thank you so much. Prior to his, he calls, inevitable move to Westminster, Canterbury, and Richmond, he says he hopes to publish, privately, no doubt, his post-retirement manuscript, How Virginia Moves and Why, a survey of the evolution of transportation in Virginia from Jamestown to Wallops Island. That is multimodal. <laughs> a widower, Beatles, is loved and supported by three wonderful daughters, which we have two here, son-in-law, and four grandchildren. So, Dick, I will turn it over to you as you tell us about Ashley. <laughs> Thank you, Anne. I may be one of those that doesn't need a mic. If anybody can hear me, let me know. I took my jacket off because I see everybody else is doing likewise. Some people can't hear you. Can't hear, okay. There you go. All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. I took my jacket off because I see that this is a fairly casual audience and as any good stump speaker would do, the first thing you do is take your jacket off. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something to say. <laughs> uh, I'm delighted to be here. I always enjoy being in Ashland uh, for any, almost any occasion. And uh, uh, Anne, thank you for the Lengthy, lengthy. <laughs> I begged her to cut it short, but she doesn't listen to me. Uh, so there's not much time left for the problem. <laughs> uh, I'm glad to be a part of the celebration of the 100th anniversary of the station, which is a real icon in Ashland. And, uh, I must point out that some of the advanced material that I received about the 5 p.m. program today over at the station attributed the gift of the station by R.F. and P. Railroad to the town to me. Well, that's not right. It was my predecessor, John Newbell, who made that decision, a good decision. And uh, I may have signed some papers along the way, but it was John's uh, uh, initiative. Uh, John got plenty of reward for that because he retired very shortly thereafter and uh, as his successor it was my pleasure and responsibility to plan his retirement <laughs> celebration. And what could be more appropriate than a train ride? <laughs> so John didn't really know what was coming but we told him to be at Broad Street Station or wherever in those days. We moved around a little bit uh, at, at a certain hour to bring his family. And we, of course, had a number of his co-workers with us. And we took a train ride to Fredericksburg and returned, sort of a rolling party. <laughs> and uh, at the time, Dick Gillis was still presiding here in town proclaiming the son of the universe. And Liddell Payne was the president of the college. And I called them both and asked them if they'd do me a favor and put on a little show, a little reception 
for Johnny Newbell when we passed through town. So lo and behold, that little bobtail train rolled into town one evening, and there beside the track were Randolph Hank and cheerleaders, a, a small brass band, <laughs> and Dick Gillis bellowing, welcome to the center of the earth. <laughs> So Newbow went away in grand style. Uh, I have spent the last couple of decades going around giving talks about the future of rail, which interests me a great deal. So it's kind of unusual for me to be talking about the history, although that also interests me. So I'll do the best I can to relate some R&P history that I think is relevant to Ashland but I'm staying completely away from Ashland town history because the room is full of historians. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not a historian. I'm all of a storyteller. <laughs> a storyteller grabs little bits and pieces of history and, uh, and weaves them together in a yarn that may or may not be totally correct. So anything you hear from me, you better double check it. <laughs> <laughs> But I like to I like to turn my mind back in time to the beginning of the 19th century, uh, which is a pretty stark picture of transportation in Virginia. Uh, there wasn't much. Virginia was blessed by our Creator or nature or cosmic powers, whatever you want to believe, with a wonderful. Water transportation, my goodness, is Doug Riddell. <laughs> now I've really got to be on my P's and Q's. <laughs> Blessed with a wonderful water transportation system around the Chesapeake Bay and the river tributaries to the bay. And uh, that sufficed for a couple hundred years. But as the tobacco production wore tight water land and moved inland, uh, finding transportation to serve the rest of the state of Virginia uh, became a big challenge. Richmond, uh, which was blessed with uh, a navigable river uh, up to the falls, of course, uh, relied on water transportation almost exclusively, not totally. There were, there were stagecoach routes that could get you to Northern Virginia and eventually D.C., but it took generally two days. And uh, if you were shipping or traveling by steamboat out of Richmond and going to D.C. or Baltimore or New York, for example, you had to spend one day going in the wrong direction towards Hampton Roads before you turned around and headed north again. And that's what gave rise, basically, to the need for a shortcut, which the RFP was initially conceived as a shortcut to the Potomac River at the nearest point north of Fredericksburg that was practical to reach. Well, here I, I'd like to reintroduce you, many of you know this, uh, to the Robinson Brothers. Now, <clears throat> there's a street here in town. I hope you've noticed a sign next to the library, Robinson Street. Well, I'm not sure which of the Robinsons this is named for. There were at least three brothers, maybe more, but three that had a direct bearing on R&P's early history and, in fact, continuing history up to a point. There was Moncure, the engineer, civil engineer. There was Conway the uh, lawyer, a distinguished lawyer, I might say, and there was Edwin, the budding real estate developer, who did like most real estate developers, finally went broke. <laughs> <laughs> you know that story. But by the way, I didn't know that story until I read Roseanne Shelf's book on Ashland history. Our, working for the RFP in days of old, was kind of like being part of an old Southern family. We didn't talk about crazy aunts or alcoholic uh, uncles, and therefore there were two company-sponsored histories, Mordecai's in 1940 
in, in Bill Griffin's uh, later, uh, that completely omitted Edwin Robinson's disgrace, that is, in so far as the board of directors was concerned, <laughs> by overextending the company here in, in town real estate development. But <clears throat> Moncure, who was born in 1802, was, uh, I think, the most interesting character. He was clearly a bright young man. He matriculated at William and Mary. He didn't graduate, I don't think. He, he was asked to leave along with some of his fellow students for some sort of rebellion against the faculty. So <laughs> nothing new under the sun. <laughs> but he was, he was great at math. And he really, he aspired to be a civil engineer, although he probably not heard that term. Because there was, there was scarcely any civil engineering instruction in, in an academic sense. In fact, only the U.S. Military Institute I've, I've read offered uh, civil engineering courses at that time. But uh, Moncure naturally gravitated to the canal building. The James River Canal Improvement Project started, it got its start in 1785. Uh, that was the, the first piece from Richmond out to West Ham. And it, it didn't go very well. In fact, it got taken over subsequently by the State Board of Public Works. And it didn't go very well again. And then in the 1830s, it got taken over by the James River and Kanoa Canal Company, and it still didn't go very good. But Moncure decided he knew there must be something better. And how he did this amazes me, but he was 22 to 25 years old, perhaps. And he somehow got connected with Governor DeWitt Clinton in New York, who was spearheading the Erie Canal Project. I'm sure you all remember the Erie Canal was, <clears throat> was a breakthrough in inland transportation in America, and it was a great success story, and it really put other states on edge, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, et cetera. And so there was a lot of pressure to press forward with canal building, even though they were looking at the Allegheny Range of mountains, which should have told them something. <laughs> <laughs> So Moncure tried to convince people who had been at it long before him that there must be something better than the canal project. And he took off for, for England and ultimately the continent where he learned more professional civil engineering and was introduced to the application of the steam engine, not the locomotive, but the motive power uh, device using steam uh, and uh, he came back oh, in his travels he fell in with some well-to-do Philadelphia young people contemporary age they were better connected by far and when he came back declaring himself qualified to build railroads as well as canals he was employed by the Pennsylvania State uh, entity that was then assisting in the developing many of the little anthracite roads, uh, but also the so-called main line of public works, which would ultimately be the Pennsylvania Railroad main line across the state. So he made quite a reputation for himself and uh, was soon called back to Virginia to do the same kind of thing for the Commonwealth of Virginia and for the many, many startup railroads of which there were quite a handful at that time. RF and P being one. RF and P was not the first, but it was one of the first. And uh, so it was my cure with three buddies from Philadelphia who laid out location and design, we would say today, the RF and P route to Fredericksburg and presumably beyond uh, Quiet Creek, which was the ultimate uh, pre-Civil War terminus of uh, the RFP. Uh, meanwhile,
while Brother Conway had assumed the presidency of RFP, and uh, later Moncure came back and succeeded him, and ultimately uh, Edwin succeeded Moncure. And then finally, after the war, the Civil War, uh, Moncure's son, John Moncure, served as president of RFP. So for the first 45 years of RFP's existence, 30 years were Robinson Brothers. So the next time you see that sign by the library, remember <laughs> the Robinson Brothers did a lot of good. Mm, some may be a little shady, but a lot of good. <laughs> and I like to think, what in the world did this piece of God's creation, where we stand, look like in 1800 or, or 1834, even when, you, when RFP received its charter. It could have been cut over stumpage, slash, as the term seems to have evolved. Uh, it could have been some worn out tobacco plots, because as you know, tobacco tended to wear out the fertility of the soil. Um, but it, there was no particular compelling reason that I can think of that Moncure had to run his line right through this piece of geography right here. He, his mission was to go to Fredericksburg and then beyond Fredericksburg to the nearest practical point on the Potomac. Uh, there was something else, two other things that influenced the rooting of RFP. Uh, there was coal all around Richmond, the west of Richmond, including the Springfield coal pits, uh, also known as deep run coal pits, most particularly concentrated around Gaskin, or today's Gaskins and Broad. So Moncure ran his line not due north, but north, northwest to Hungary Station, what became Hungary Station which today is known as Laurel, and, and had that line been extended, the RFP would have wound up somewhere around Montpelier on Route 33. But so the first real curve in RFP is at Laurel, and that's not the last curve. <laughs> there are a lot of curves in the RFP, contrary to the promotional material that shows straight up. Uh, the other thing that interested Moncure and impacted the location and benefited Ash future Ashland was the need to connect with the then under consideration Louisa Railroad. Uh, Louisa was a big, big a tobacco producer at that point, and the North Anna and the South Anna were not particularly uh, receptive to navigational improvements beyond the fall line. So some of the same shakers and movers in Richmond and in Barnes who had conceived the RFP also were collaborating with Louisa efforts to build a railroad to connect with the RFP somewhere around Taylorsville or what is now Doswell. And uh, Moncure Robinson designed that line, laid out that line. And for, for about 10 years, the RFP operated the Louisa Railroad, and to Brother Edwin, all of the Bro Robinson brothers were given to having the disagreements with business partners and others. Uh, the, the head of the Louisa Railroad was uh, Edwin Fontaine, and Edwin Fontaine and Edwin Robinson had a big feud that resulted in termination of that working arrangement between the two. And that's what led to Edmund Fontaine and his board deciding to press on east of Dazzle, because <clears throat> they call it kind of a cross and a half of a junction at that point. So the line between Dazzle and Hanover Courthouse and Atley and ultimately Richmond Main Street Station came about because RFMP messed up something that could have worked very well. Um, anyhow, 
Uh, we know what happened during the Civil War, and it doesn't need to be uh, replayed, except uh, the, when Edwin Robinson lost his job as president of R.P. in 1860, he was succeeded by uh, a gentleman by the name of uh, Daniel. And Peter, Peter B. Daniel, Jr., Peter B. Daniel, Jr., uh, Daniel held on for a long period of time through difficult conditions. He also apparently tolerated uh, a disloyal, from a southern perspective, uh, superintendent of transportation by the name of Ruth. Uh, I never could figure out just what Ruth did bad, but he he had the audacity after the war to apply for a federal pension, claiming that he had helped the federal uh, side. And maybe he did. I don't know the history in detail. Uh, I do know that Peter Daniels' father has an infamous reputation. He was, in a, he was a sitting Supreme Court Justice in Washington and before the war, and I guess during the war. Uh, and he is, he wrote the concurring opinion in uh, the Dred Scott case, which we remember to this day as the infamous Supreme Court decision that declared slaves were property, not people. So we have a lot of stuff to be ashamed of in our history, as well as things that we can be proud of. After the war, <clears throat> The architect Daniel, Peter Daniel, found a, a young engineer by the name of, well, he was known as Major Myers, Major because of his service in the Confederate military as a construction man. Uh, uh, Ma Major Myers had worked for uh, Crozet, Claudius Crozet, on a number of projects prior to the war, including the great. Blue Ridge Tunnel on Afton Mountain at Rockville, Rockfish Gap. Well, Major Myers turned out to be a real gem, and he got the RFP humming and in the 80s and 90s, and he became president through the, at the turn of the century. And when he died in 1905, he was serving as president of the company, and it was he that had double tracked the railroad so that was the first, second track in Ashland, and I don't think he was stoned for it at the time. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, uh, I never, in looking at, and I have looked at most of the RFP annual reports over the years, and I, nobody ever got a, a final uh, salute, uh, commemorative recognition in one of the annual reports than E.D.T. Myers, who, by the way, interestingly, wound up being a Jewish Episcopalian. <laughs> 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 was, anyhow, he was, he was much admired. And after the, he was succeeded by, um, there were several interim presidents, and then there was a lawyer from Norfolk by the name of White that was president for a while. And uh, about the time Mr. White came on board, and, and, I, and maybe Major Myers hired this fellow, but uh, Edgar M. Hastings showed up. Edgar M. Hastings, a native of Lutherville, Maryland, uh, born in 1883 or 84, uh, was another engineer of distinction. Uh, Major uh, E.G. E. <laughs> Edgar, Edgar Hastings served from, in engineering capacities from 1905 or 6 to 1950. And he was responsible for every major project from the James Road, the classic James Rover Bridge in Richmond. Uh, to Broad Street Station, uh, to Potomac Yard, 
and many other things in between. The reason I like to bring up Mr. Hastings at this point uh, is that I think he lived in Ashland for a while. And the reason I think he lived in Ashland for a while, one of his sons, David C. Hastings, was born in Ashland on Christmas Day, 1915. And Edgar G. Hastings is buried in Woodland, is it Woodland or Woodland Cemetery in Ashland. The reason that has relevance to us today on this special day is that I am convinced this is where I say I take a bit of history and I leap over and <laughs> draw some conclusions that may or may not be right. He had to know uh, w. Lee, w. Duncan Lee. They had the, they were virtually contemporaries and <clears throat> Mr. Hastings was a very, uh, uh, very much into professional circles. He once later became national president of the American Society of Civil Engineers. He, uh, he, he was given uh, fact-finding missions after World War II to China by the Truman administration during the era when we were wondering what in the world was going to happen to China. Um, David, his son, I personally knew, and some of, some of you may have known David Hastings, but he worked for R&P, uh, rising to be superintendent of Potomac Yard. And after that, he was summoned by Tom Rice, a, a famous 20th century president of r &P, Atlantic Coastline, and, that later became Seaboard Coastline. But David Hastings was quite a guy. He too, a BMI civil engineer, all business, at least it was where I was concerned. Uh, I didn't have a close relationship with him. To, to David Hastings, I was Beatles. <laughs> Until one day, to my surprise, I walked across the street to the bank when we used to have a bank across from Rochester Station. And there was David Hastings and his wife seated at stoplight. And he beckons me over and introduces me to his wife by my real name. <laughs> <laughs> but to credit Dave Hastings as a man, uh, one thing that I find in his, his uh, write-up is that after he retired from a big job, executive vice president of CSX, uh, he served 15 years as his church administrator. He was a good Methodist. And uh, obviously he would have done that pro bono. And he would have done it in his usual military manner. And I cannot help but wonder how many committee chairs got rammed out for late reporting of the minutes. <laughs> Rest in peace, David Hastings. <laughs> well, I'm reaching the end of my allotted time. Uh, a lot more happened in the 20th century that I'll just hit on without explaining. But major events that occurred in the 20th century that impacted the RFP in Ashland would have been World War I when the federal government, uh, Woodrow Wilson then being president, uh, took over control of, of most American railroads from 1917 to 1920. Uh, railroad executives of that era never got over it because it may have been unnecessary and it created a terrible amount of, of, of controversy, mostly financial. The other thing that happened in the in the 20th century was the 1920s leading into the Great Depression. The 1920s are when roads in Virginia, federal road, federally supported roads in Virginia got their numbers. Uh, I'm of the opinion, having verified this, that Route 1 wasn't Route 1 until 1920 something. 
So there were a number of ways to get to Washington meandering through the countryside, other than what we now know as Route 1, and of course now 95. Uh, better roads brought better surface transportation for truckers, and that had an impact negatively on RFP, and that's probably and, and Model T Fords too. So that's where the Ashland accommodation trains went out in 1928. I kind of think, again, a, a leap of faith. I kind of think uh, Chief Engineer Hastings, who I believe was living in Ashland, stopped commuting to Richmond and moved to Richmond. And uh, some of us who live not too far from Route 1, south of here, and in later years, remember the Ashland bus, the so-called Ashland bus that replaced the uh, accommodation or commuter train. The RFP, by the way, went into the bus business at that time, and not many people realized that RFP was half owner of Richmond Greyhound, which operated between Washington, Richmond, and Norfolk until they sold that interest in the 1960s, I believe. And then there was World War II, which was a, the high water mark of rail operations through Ashland. I don't, I can't imagine what it was like with steam engines and all of the trains that came through Ashland, some stopping, but most coming through. But World War II wound up with the railroads, such as RFP, having a, a file full of commendations from Federal Department of Defense, well, it was the War Department then, but uh, various federal cabinet level people, right, what a great job they've done. And then came Eisenhower, and uh, I, I'm a fan of Dwight D. Eisenhower, but Eisenhower didn't give a rip about railroads, and most people, most GIs who had ridden trip trains didn't give a rip about railroads either. <laughs> <laughs> so we had, the, we had the Interstate Highway Act of 1956, and that, that had the greatest negative impact. I'm not condemning the Interstate Highway system. I'm just saying it had the greatest negative business impact on RFP and its business, and that's how people stop getting on and off the train to Nashville, most of them. Anyhow, as I indicated at the outset, I like to talk about the future of rail, which is full of exciting news of things that are happening, which we will, go, go, we will not go into tonight. But uh, if I live long enough, and you get desperate enough, <laughs> I know the speaker someday. <laughs> I'll tell you what, what is happening north of us particularly at this time. It's amazing. It's big time civil engineering work. It's, it has enormous positive implications for rail, and ultimately it has implications for Ashland. And with that, I'll turn the mic over to who model would like to claim it. And thank you for your... saying he's going to have to be on the high speed rail if he's going to make it from the 1800s all the way. <laughs> so, but you did it and you did it in wonderful fashion and I will tell you that as an educator there's no better way for children to learn and to understand their history than to hear it through story. Yeah. So that is, that is the way that it sticks with them the most. Now I just want to, if you will indulge me, Dick was interviewed by uh, the uh, editor, Rosalind Ryan, of the local, the, the inserts on Wednesday, and this is what she had to say about him. Dick Beadle knows an awful lot about trains and transportation in general. Really, probably more than anyone you're likely to beat. He won't tell you that himself, of course. Not a chance. In fact, 
the lifelong rail aficionado and former president of the RF&D Railroad would sooner be tied to a track and left there to proclaim himself <laughs> any sort of expert on history of the rail travel in the United States. Its critical role in moving people and goods long before the birth of the interstate highway system and its burgeoning renaissance in places like North Carolina. Even so, the fact remains Dick Beatles knows an awful lot about trains. <laughs> Thank you, Dick. A lot of other people do too. I don't have a corner on this market. And I want to particularly introduce, if you don't, I don't know where Jim Smith is, but hey Jim. Jim is a former chief engineer and more of American Fee and lives right here in Ashland. And if you want to know the real stuff about RFP, see Jim. <laughs> No, because I take the cheaper trains. <laughs> <laughs> brought the college to Ashland and having the access to the RF&P is what really saved it. I think that's true at that time. But of course now, you know, I, my, my mental picture of Ashland stops at Route 1. <laughs> <laughs> all west of Route 1. Now that's not to be unkind, but the character is so different that who can say, it was I-95 that changed east of 95, not RF&P. But the point is, transportation makes a big impact. Oh, without a doubt, without a doubt. Anyone else? Rosie? Oh, I just wanted to share with you a story. Um, you know, Lois Wickham, she was Lois Wingfield Wickham, um, married the grandson of William Carter Wickham, who was um, head of a rival railroad. But um, he had this story that he told her, and she embellished it beautifully for a bunch of students I was teaching. One time we interviewed her. She said, it was in the middle of the night, and all these railroad people came the, uh, and finished the line, the Louisa line, across the RFMP line. In the middle of the night, there wasn't anything RFMP could do about it. And it was the only, uh, she said something about they were concerned about it because it was an at-grade crossing. Uh, I, can't, I can't speak to that, uh, <laughs> but I can tell you that it generated a Supre U.S. Supreme Court case mm -hmm. as to whether the Virginia Central could, in fact, legally cross there. Oh, got a college degree in civil engineering in 1901, so there were a few around in those days. What, what, ex what explains the, uh, you made reference to this earlier, the big loop that the RFP makes from Ruth and Glenn over to Milford and back around, but he could have gone straight ahead. Well, Jim Smith and I had a conversation about that recently. He's smiling, he must know the answer. He's a local <laughs> expert, so you see him. <laughs> question about Potomac Yards. Uh, that's a gold mine. When did the railroad, did the railroad company sell that property? I don't know that we have time. <laughs> <laughs> this defies a, a real quick answer, but the, the short answer, which doesn't do justice mm -hmm. to it, is the state of Virginia acquired R.F. real estate in 1991. And the railroad went to CSX car. Mm -hmm. And so whatever uh, blame or credit you 
you, you have to give to the state. Mm -hmm. But we had done we had done for many years planning to facilitate the redevelopment of Potomac Yard. Now this 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 puts me in a terrible conflict because, as my all too lengthy intro indicated, I, I had real estate involvement on behalf of the railroad as well as transportation, and. What happened to Potomac Yard was, after the Interstate Highway Act of 1956, the railroads gradually got out of what I call the retail transportation business. They stopped handling small shipments, and they stopped serving individual a car here, a car there. So they wanted to do volume business, like remember the, the orange juice cars that come to oh, yeah. well, They love to do big, big slugs of business and not wholesale type rather than retail. Potomac Yard, which once had almost a hundred classification tracks. Classification tracks are like a postal clerk's sorting mail, you know, putting cars according to the ultimate destination. That, that function dried up over time. So it, the Potomac Yard was, was in fact a potential gold mine. But before you count your money, you better see the powers that be in the city of Alexandria and Arlington County because they extracted their price for permitting you. See, railroad property was just kind of painted as always railroad, and it wasn't integrated into the transportation and utilities network of localities. So you have to kind of start from scratch when you develop railroad property. Don't sit down, Dick. I have a question for you, too. <laughs> <laughs> now, you, did you visit for many years, Ashland, once a year, and there was some kind of waiver that you had to sign? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I should have said, if I haven't conveyed by my actions, I'm probably the most insignificant president of R&P ever had. <laughs> and, so. Ann asked me if it, if it was anything I ever did for Ashland, and uh, I had a hard time coming up with it. <laughs> and, and as part of my portfolio of responsibilities at r and I had real estate, and, among other things. And I would notice periodically we had to sign uh, a waiver or, or release of a covenant that had been in the original 400 and some acre uh, slash cottage condition uh, subdivision plan. The covenant said in my, link, my terms, thou shall not uh, make, store, consume, or sell alcoholic beverages <laughs> on this property. So every time a piece of property changed hands in that, on that part of Ashland, the title people always took exception to that. And they, they would contact the R and P, and we just had a standard procedure for a hundred dollars. We ran around and got the signatures and, and exempted that for, for that lot. Well, I, we probably lost two hundred dollars making a hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Typical railroad pricing. <laughs> so, so I said one day, "Isn't there something we can do to eliminate this once and for all?" And lo and behold, there was. So, that requirement has been wiped from the county records and no longer exists. No longer exists. Yeah. It made honest people. I wrote. I wrote that check. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my house in 1975 on the racecourse. <laughs> if you want relief from this, send a hundred dollars to the RP. <laughs> and, and, and this is me making my big leap about history. My philosophy about it is is that with that resort and everything here, they didn't want any competition with anybody having their drinks anywhere well, else. Exactly. They were not right. they buying right. it from them. Rogers and spiritual slickers. <laughs> anyway, that's a lovely story, and thank you for sharing it with us. That, oh, we got another question back here. You've you talked about competition, and I got your links on. I'm not sure okay. whether you covered this or not. The, the, uh, when the r &P was chartered, they were given uh, a, was it a hundred year deal with the state of Virginia where, whereby nobody could build a parallel <laughs> railroad between Richmond and Washington. And uh, basically, uh, 
How did how did that how was that resolved? It came it first came to a head uh, in 1850 when the Virginia Central, which was the successor to Louisa Railroad, wanted to cross the Arthur P. and Dawes Wall to Hanover Junction. Uh, it and it and it. Uh, the court ruling was ambiguous. Uh, basically, it said, as long as they're just going to Richmond and not to Fredericksburg and Washington, they can do it. That's my interpretation. Uh, it, it got most serious at the turn of the 20th century, 1900, when John Skelton Williams, who was building the Seaboard Railroad into Richmond, applied for a charter to build all the way to D.C. parallel in R.P. And <clears throat> the legislature finally said, okay, John Skelton Williams, you can build your railroad by the R.P., but not until somebody has bought us out of our ownership of R.P. at a premium price, <laughs> which never happened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but, but then, but then um, another thing happened. Um, they decided to do a trolley line, which wasn't really a trolley line, it was a railroad line from <coughs> Richmond to Ashland. And there was a big hullabaloo about, and it was the same thing. But those people said, oh no, we're not going up to Washington, we're going to go to Northern Neck, and we're going to take um, uh, freight, you know, um, uh, farm uh, produce to the Northern Neck. Hey, you know, the, the, the trolley line was a big deal. But that, now I understand why they claimed they were going to go to the Northern Neck and not up to DC. Just because of that all right. fourth thing. Well, Dick, again, thank you for coming to Ashland once again. Yeah.